Welcome to the Tennis.com podcast, coming to you from the USTA National Campus in Lake Nona. I'm Nina Pantic, one of your hosts, joined by Irina Falcone. Hey guys, how's it going? Our special guest today is Chris Eubanks. Chris, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're here at the USTA, so let's start with that. How's your off-season going? What's the plan for this month? Off-season just got underway, so uh, I finished my tournament in Champaign. I flew down the next morning and figured, you know, it's a good time as ever to go ahead and start up, try to get a leg up on the competition. So I started up this week, just finished my first week. Things have been going really well, and I'm excited to keep going for the next, what, next four or five weeks. So you didn't have any time off? Did you take any vacation days or anything like that? No, no, not really. I, I, I tend to like to stay in the rhythm of continuing to work and continuing to train because when you take time off, Sometimes it's real tough to come back. Those first few sessions when you're getting gassed in 10 minutes, is not, it's not fun. But if you just keep going, as long as the body feels healthy and the mind feels healthy, I'm like, why not just keep going? So, Well, it's good to see that you don't have, like, ice everywhere and, like, kinesio tape everywhere. So that's not yet. That's a plus. Not yeah, yet. that's don't, true. Don't jinx it's only it. first week. Don't jinx it. So Chris is ranked currently inside the top 200 and has played for Georgia Tech. You are a Yellow Jacket, just like Irina here. Whoop, whoop. We yeah. are. We are. We're a Yellow Jacket family, and uh, Irina's a legend on the flat, so <laughs> it's pretty cool to sit with her right now. Oh, <laughs> We're buzzing. Can you tell us the process of choosing Georgia Tech? Why'd you end up there? Because they recruited me, and not many other schools did, so it was pretty easy. Are Wasn't you serious? Like it. Yeah. That's, had, that was your journey? I had about... I had... I had about, I would say, probably five schools. Five schools reached out to me uh, before Kalamazoo, before National Hardcourts. That was it. And that was my junior year. Georgia Tech showed the most interest. Georgia Tech made it very clear. Kenny, Thorne, and Derek Schwann, they made it very clear that they wanted me, and they they really thought I could be a good addition to the team. Uh, There were a few other schools. I sent out, funny thing is, I sent out numerous emails to college coaches that I – you know, thought I wanted to go to their schools. Got a few responses and, and got a couple note. just, you know, like the, I'm sure they read it, just figure, you know, why respond. So it's all good. I made a mental note of some of those schools and made sure, uh, made sure I got their number when I got the opportunity to. So <laughs> it's all good now. Everything worked out. I'm sure they're regretting not responding. Oh, to yeah, I'm sure. So. I yeah, so. good. You showed them. All right, yeah, I, I don't let them forget it either. But yeah. then you turned pro before your senior year. You got in as high as number four, I want to say, in the nation. Four in singles. It's not bad. Turned pro before your senior year. What led you to, to jump ship a little early? Uh, I had a really good summer of 2017. And like it's something I didn't really foresee coming. Uh, I kind of set the goal up before the year. I said, you know, my junior year, NCAA is in Athens. I would love nothing more than to win NCAA singles as a Georgia Tech Yellow Jacket in Athens on their courts. I lost in the quarters to Ty Kwiatkowski, who ended up going on to take the title. Um, but I kind of said, you know, I think that if I'm able to win NCAAs, I think, you know, I really have to consider possibly not coming back. I just thought it would be a good time. Once I lost in the quarters, my mind immediately flipped. All right, senior year, you know, we're coming back. And then uh, I had a couple good runs and some 25Ks. I won a 25K and final in back-to-back weeks. Didn't really think much of it. I thought it was really cool. I said, man, you know, that this is really cool getting the chance to, you know, take a pro title. Um, and then after that, I got a wild card into Atlanta in our quarterfinal. And that's and I beat two guys that were firmly inside the top 100, uh, Jared Donaldson and Taylor Fritz. And I said, you know, things are looking a little different now. I might have to, you know, reconsider some things. But, you know, I kind of downplayed a little bit by saying I was playing in my hometown on courts that suited me. And I had a pretty much a packed stadium every single match. You're not going to get that type of support everywhere you go on tour. So, let me dial it back. I was kind of riding cloud nine, and then I went to Cincy on a last-minute wild card and ended up qual- uh, qualifying in and lost a tough one in the first round. But I beat, I had a, won a couple really, really good matches against quality opponents, and I said, you know what, we might need to take a second look at this. I think, I think, I think I might be able to do this, um, and That's I awesome. think the opportunity kind of, it just kind of fell into place right then, and. I had to kind of jump on it. That, that's pretty much what it boiled down to. I thought it would be the perfect opportunity to go and pursue my dream, and, and I haven't regretted it since. So you had the intention to go and play professional tennis before you went to Georgia Tech? or was Yeah, well, I said it. Like every kid who's 15, 16 said, oh, I want to be a pro, but I didn't really – I didn't have the junior results that I felt like a lot of pros did. I didn't have the ITF titles. I, I think I think I maybe had one ITF point. 
Um, I don't, I played two of them, but they were both the Atlanta ITFs. But you know, I lost in qualies and lost second round in one. So I and even in the national events and juniors, I wasn't one of the guys who was sitting top in the country. So I kind of I said it, but in my head, I honestly thought it would be a bit of a long shot. And then college kind of gave me the chance to you know work on my game, develop my game, develop my body, and then after you're playing match after match after match week after week you kind of start getting the hang of it and then it just kind of went from there and i said you know what this might have been uh this was 100 percent the 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 route to go for me but if i hadn't gone to college and more particularly if i hadn't gone to georgia tech i don't think i would be pro right now was that call to coach kenny tough yeah very very but the thing is i was we were i was pretty honest with with him and in terms of when the thoughts started creeping into my mind about possibly not coming back it was during the U.S. Open. I remember he was back. He came. He was at the Open with me. He left to go back to the team for about a week, and then when he came back up, I I stayed up there and I said, you know, I'm thinking about. We sat down. I said, I'm thinking about possibly not coming back. And he said, okay, well, you know, take me through your thought process. I said, there are some opportunities that could be on the table. Um, I think I think I'm playing well, and honestly, I don't know if I want to. I think at that point I was sitting at about. Four or five hundred in the world in college, and I was like, if I go and I play a full season, that means I'm coming back into the summer with all of my points to defend over three months. So if those don't go well, I'm starting at ground zero. If I go pro, I have the chance to play in the fall, play in the spring, and kind of build my ranking up, so I don't worry have to worry about that drop. And he said, you know, I understand. You know, he said the only thing I'm going to ask of you is you not make the decision right now. I said in New York, there are a lot of lights, there are a lot of people telling you you're great. Uh, a lot of people telling you, you're, you, you know, you feel like you're on top of the world. He said, just do me a favor. Don't make the decision. Don't make the decision now. Wait till you get back to Atlanta. Things die down and see if you still feel that way. In my head, I left from that talk saying, all right, he's just saying, I don't know. I'm going pro, like whatever. Like <laughs> I probably can make the decision right now. I can sign right now. No biggie. Right. Sure enough, I get back to Atlanta. I spent about a week there, maybe two weeks. And I sit, I'm sitting in my room and I go, am I really about to leave school? Like, this is scary. Like, this is scarier than I thought. So I'm sitting there. I'm like, there are no lights. There are no people calling my phone, asking for tickets, saying, oh, you're great. You played a tough one, but, you know, you're, you're so good. And I'm kind of like, oh, man, he was right. He was right. And I had to sit there. And I had to go back and forth. And, and, and I talked to a few people. I reached out to Steve Johnson. Uh, we talked a little bit. And I reached out to some other people. And I think eventually I came to the conclusion that I think it would be the right time to, to leave early. And I was comfortable with that decision. I gave him a call, and I was, I'll never forget. I was outside of um, – I remember I was standing on the sidewalk outside of a restaurant. I was in with a friend. And I said, you going in, I'll, I'll, I'll come back. Uh, I'll, I'll come in after you. And I said, "This is, I have to call him because I've been putting it off for about two days. So I called him. I said, hey, Kenny. He goes, hey, Banks, what's up? You know, classic Kenny. And I'm like, you know, I was kind of thinking about our talk in New York, and, you know, things have kind of died down, and I've – and be honest, I'm really, really fa fairly nervous, but I think that it would be the right decision for me to leave school. And I've decided that I'm going to leave school and I'm going to I'm going to turn pro. He goes, man, I'm so proud of you. He said, I'm so proud of you. Aww. He said, um, first thing he said, OK, we got to get a release out. We got to talk. We got to figure out how we can get this out to, you know, everyone at Tech so they can know and, and, and you know, share you know, we can do something to kind of share all that you meant to Georgia Tech and all that you've uh, you've done for the program. He said, man, thank you so much. He said, we've enjoyed having you. I've enjoyed having you. He said, and, I'm, and you're not going to get uh, get rid of me that easy. He said, you know that if there's any time you want to come back, practice, even talk, do some individual stuff on the court, I'm always here for you. Um, we can go out. We can work anytime you want. You just let me know. And it just made me so much more at ease with the decision because wow. I knew he was 100% supportive of it. He never tried to kind of, you know, string me back in and say, no, we need you for one more year. I told him I made the decision. I was comfortable with it. He said, you know what? Have you talked to anyone from the SID department? I said, no. He goes, all right, I think you should reach out to him. He said, we're going we're, we're gonna to build this up, man. This is really cool. This is something that's really cool. We have a player who decided who left early to go play pro. He said, I, I'm so happy for you. I'm excited for you. And let's tear it up. I'll never forget it. So it's wow. pretty awesome. That's awesome. Honestly, you about had me tearing up because I can totally see Coach Kenny doing that. Yeah, and yeah I mean, you know exactly just, how Kenny is. Oh, my gosh. He's got the biggest heart. So that is so exciting. That is such a cool story. Thanks for sharing that with us. No problem. Yeah.
Right. Wow. So you're 23 years old. You made this decision at 21 years old, and it's been two years. You're already in the top 200. Has it been easier or harder than you thought it would be? Um, I think it's a it's the the quality that I have to bring and 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 put in every single day is about what I expected. The mental aspect of it is something that I didn't really expect. That there, and I'll be honest, there's certain weeks that. You know, your first year on tour, everything is pretty much all you're only going up. So you feel like you're on top of the world and you're like, oh, man, this pro tennis thing isn't isn't hard. <laughs> the second year comes around and you got to defend some points and uh, you can you can slowly kind of get caught up in it and watch. For me, I started the year ranked at around 170. Right now I'm sitting close to 200. And I think by the end of the year, I'll drop a little bit more. But you're sitting there week after week watching it kind of drop and you're knowing, man, this week I have 30 coming up. Oh, man, this week I have 25 coming off like it's a. It, it takes a toll on you mentally. Um, and then at the end of the year, you think back at some of the weeks that maybe you weren't all there mentally, at least for me. There there were certain times in which I kind of I went to some tournaments by myself, maybe not in the best frame of mind to really dig in and compete. And you just squander some opportunities because you're like, you know, I'm tired. I, I don't want to be here. This is this. I want to be home. I want I'm, it just it gets to you. And it, it really, really gets to you, and it's something you don't really expect. And now at the end of the year, I'm looking at some of those weeks where I'm like, "What was I doing, man? I win a couple more of those matches. I'm, I'm, you know, firmly inside 200. Like, how can you just mentally just, just wilt like that?" Um, but I think it's just an experience that I'm going to learn from, and I'll go into 2020 knowing that every single week could be a huge week. And even when the the conditions might not be in your favor, or you just might not be there mentally, you got to find a an ability to find a way to dig into a deeper place to be able to try to make every week a big week because a couple of good weeks on tour can set you up for the rest of the year. So I think that's something I got to learn from, and I think I will learn from it and try to let uh, those oppor- try not to squander those opportunities uh, nearly as much if if ever. So it's funny you say that because I worked with a coach back in the day, Jorge Tadero, yeah. and uh, he used to tell me he's like it's eight weeks. Eight weeks out of the year, that's all you need. Eight good weeks. I was like, what? Like, you don't think about it like that. He's like, yeah. If you think about it, you can have a few, like, okay weeks, and you can have some bad weeks, but eight good weeks is really what you need to be in a really good position on yeah, the tour. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100%. And it's that's kind of like the mentality you have to take into it every single week. You have to go into it and say, you know what? Granted, this might not be the Australian Open. Uh, for me, this might be, you know, the Dallas Challenger. But I need to treat it just as important and just as big as the Australian Open because you win this tournament, you get 100 points on the rank, and you jump 60, 70 spots. You're just going from being, you know, in qualities of slams to being seated in qualities of slams. So it can all flip just like that. So you got to kind of be able to go to that place every single time. And if you're not, you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself on some other weeks. So I think that's probably some of the things that I got to learn from in the second year, and I think I'll take that into 2020. It's good you're realizing that now because at the end of the day, it's just another match, right? Just another match. Exactly. Hey everyone, we're here with ATP Tour player Chris Eubanks talking about hitting with the legend Roger Federer and hitting him in a kind of a private spot. Keep listening. All right, I'm going to flip this a little bit and talk about your Instagram. Are you and Naomi Osaka pals? That's that's my best friend right there. That's one of my best friends right there. Yeah, she loves giving me a hard time, but I do the same to her. So it's all good. I don't, I'm not going to get, uh, not going to go too, too deep in it and, and, and bust her out like that. But, you know, we, uh, we give each other a pretty good, pretty hard time, but as you know, she's a great person. She, she's a really, really just one of the most, the kindest people I've ever met in my life. Um, and, and we, we usually, if we're at tournaments and we get together, usually we practice a lot of times when we're at tournaments together, uh, cause she is one of the cleanest balls I've ever hit with. So, uh, she is, she strikes the ball unbelievably well. So we get out there, we practice, we talk a little trash and, uh, we end up, you know, shaking hands and, 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 you know, calling the truce at the end, but it's, it's, it's all in good fun. She's, she's a super, she's a super great person. And, uh, and yeah, we're, we're pretty tight. I've seen you've also shared the court with Roger Federer, practice court, and Serena Williams. What are moments like that for you? How memorable? Uh, those are things that are going to stay with me for the rest of my life. The the, the Roger thing, I think what, what's cool about it is I practiced, I warmed him up uh, twice at the U.S. Open, one in 2017 and 2018. Uh, 
And this year when I got to practice with him, it was it's weird just seeing him walk up and he knows my name because I'm sitting here and I go, oh, you got to be kidding. And he comes up, he goes, hey, hey, Chris, how's it going? So I'm shaking his hand. I'm like, yeah, hey, what's up, Raj? How you doing there? How's it, how's it going, Raj? You dinner later or what? But uh, so we get out there, we go on the practice court, and I'll never forget Cincy. You walk out on, and you've been to Cincy Arena, so we're I'm on we're on the practice courts that are in the the straight line. There's nothing to the left or to the right. It's about three or four courts that way. There's a stadium right to your right, and then the main stadium is right behind. So we walk on court. I think we're actually up after Sloan, I believe. I think believe Sloan's on court, and then we walk up after she's finishing, and then Roger pulls around the back. He doesn't walk through the fans, obviously, so he pulls around the back, goes through the back gate. And I walk on the court through the fans, whatever. I get on the court, and you see the stands are right there to right beside the court there's about three or four rows and you see people it's packed jam-packed so i walk on whatever i squeeze excuse me excuse me i walk on the court i drop my bag on the other side i take my racket out and i turn around and i look the stands are packed the stadium right to the side of it everyone is standing at the top of that looking over there's a match going on they're looking over to watch the riders because they know who's coming up next and then you look at the main stadium people are in the stairwell the entire stairwell, I can I would say it's probably 60, 70 feet, more than that, actually. It's really, really tall. The entire height of the stadium, right. people are jam-packed in the stairwell and on the top of the stadium to watch our practice. So at that point, I'm going, oh, no. Oh, this is <laughs> this is different. Uh, so we were just going to, you know, go out here. I mean, we were, we were set to go for, I think, two hours, hour and a half, two hours. So this wasn't a warm-up. This was a legit training session. Oh, my gosh. So we're on court. And he comes out, and the moment he walks on court, people start, you know, applauding and cheering. I start waving my hand because clearly it's for me. And then uh, – Thank you, thank you. And then he comes out, and he goes, hey, man, how's it going? We start off, we're warming up, everything's all good. And he's so disarming because he's so just just relaxed. So it's not like you don't feel that same sense of, oh, my God, like I can't miss. He's out there, he's missing. He's hitting off the back foot, trying to drop shots, whatever, feed the next ball, you keep it going. And then he comes up to take a volley. Uh, he comes up to take volleys, and I'm striking it well at this point. I'm kind of, you know, I'm feeling good and feeling it. Feeling it. So we he, uh, we're getting into an exchange, and he hits me a ball low to the backhand, and I strike it clean. I honestly don't think it's going over the net. It's straight line drive right into the net. I'm like, ah, I missed it. He doesn't think it's going over the net, so he kind of stops. Whatever. The ball gets right over the net, pops him dead in the groin. And he bends over, drops his racket, and the crowd goes, boo. It was so loud. I drop my racket. I put my hands on my head. I walk to the net. I shake his hand. I go, man, I am so sorry. I said, please, I, please don't do I am so sorry. Like, don't kick me off. He goes, man, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Just laughed it off, and we kept on going. So oh I'm sitting there, and I'm like, wow. What just happened? What just happened? So – I'm sitting up there, and from that point on, he gave me a low backhand. I was getting height. I was, like, <laughs> creating spin. Shape. Yeah, I gave him good shape, you know, perfect high percentage ball. Uh, we finished. We warmed up. And then this is this is when I, you know, his his ability and greatness kind of it, it resonated with me a little different because I warmed him up before at tournaments. And it's very casual, 20 minutes, 25 minutes maybe. We start training, and he goes, all right, Chris, you go in one corner. Roger's going to have the full, full court, or Roger's going to, uh, defend the full court you go wherever you want you said move him run him it's like a switch flicked and his intensity went to something I had never seen before he was running balls down that were three feet wide five feet long it didn't matter and he was so low so quick so fast so explosive and I said okay this is this is how you get 20 grand slams I see I you get know? it now. I get it now because every time everyone always sees him and he looks so casual he looks so relaxed like he's just out for you know a hidden giggle and he flicked a switch whenever he wanted to and i saw him bend down and he got lower and i was like what's about to happen <laughs> first ball i go forehand cross he runs out there full speed <laughs> i go other way back in knifes it get i miss one i'm like oh sorry he doesn't even hear me he just runs it down plays the next ball then it's my turn to do it <laughs> <laughs> How oh, tight that, are you? Oh, that was not fun i had the intensity had the intensity, but they weren't balls were not coming off the same. <laughs> so that was that was a really really big opening experience, and I practiced with Serena a couple times, and Serena is a little bit different in terms of her intensity is locked in from the first ball from the time she walks on the court. So that's kind of when you have the the idea of, all right, I can't miss. So 
practicing with her is a little bit different. The intensity level is remarkably high, but I am on my P's and Q's with everything. Every feed, every first ball, every ball that I'm stretched out in the corner, I'm thinking, just throw it over the net and give her a chance. Let her hit a wear on you. <laughs> just don't miss it. So it's vastly different, but but two of the icons of the sport, and after you get on court with them, you see how their greatness is, has lasted for so long. Wow. Wow. What a story. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's <laughs> how awesome. How many people can say they've shared a practice court in front of a crowd like that with Roger Federer? And, and hit him in the groin. And hit him in the and groin. That's the, that's the can't cr- forget that part. And almost took him out. <laughs> yeah, I was so tight. I said, oh, my God, these people in Tennessee aren't going to let me leave. Was this before the kids or after the kids? Oh, luckily, <laughs> luckily it was it was after. So I think he's done. If he's, oh, okay. If not, uh-oh. That's funny. There's something to be said, though, because you had to stay so focused for both those uh, sessions. You know, it's something to, to practice. It's honestly invaluable experience. Now I'm going to ask you something else even uh, a little bit a little bit off topic here. I was listening to the podcast, a podcast the other day with uh, Coco Goff on it. And in it, she mentions you're going to be going down and hanging out, maybe training with her this, this off season. Yep. And basketball comes up. Oh God! What did she say? She what said she you say? can't dunk. Oh my! She's a and liar. <laughs> Riley Opelka a... said you can, but it's eh. a maybe. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so I want you to cl- clear the air. Clarify, please. Okay. Well, I'm not. Don't listen. to Riley's seven feet, so he. I mean, there's no effort that needs to be exerted for him. Granted, Riley's good. I'm not going to say he's good at basketball because he's seven. Riley's good at basketball. I'll give it that. But Coco has no right, no <laughs> – I can't believe she would even come up and say something like that. When for one, we've never been on the court together. And two, I know for a fact she is terrible. <laughs> she is terrible. And her father was a Division One basketball player. So, granted, I'm not about to talk about her tennis because, I mean, she'll wipe the floor in terms of like what she's done in the sport. So I'm not going to even dig on that. But if we're going to talk about basketball, she's, she needs to close her mouth. Like, she's going to – we're going to have to have a little talk when I get down to Boca, and we're going to say, hey, oh well, we got beef or what? Because, <laughs> I mean, she knows. Like, I will, I, will, I will get her. I will get her pops. I will get her brothers. It doesn't matter. Anybody can get buckets. Yeah. So, I, just, I just wanted to be clear. The quote was, he claims he's good at basketball. We're going to see. He has the height, but I'm pretty sure he can't dunk, even though he's six seven. Okay. All right. Appreciate just so that. I'm not getting the heat here. This yeah, was no, no, a quote. no, 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 no. Okay. No, no, no. You're good. You're good. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Don't worry about that. We got I'm excited to see what happens oh, next no, year. Check follow my Instagram if you wanna if you yeah. wanna follow we get on the basketball court. We'll uh I'll make sure to post some videos of her. I just want people listening right now that the intensity and the focus in your eyes just like Serena got Williams fired level. up. Serena Williams You level. just got fired up Serena about level, this, for sure. and we love it. No, no, no. She's um. not going to just disrespect me like that. No chance. <laughs> no chance. No chance. You treat her like a little sister, it feels like. She is. That's why I don't know why she's talking <laughs> no, She's talking like that. I mean, these kids nowadays have no respect. <laughs> they go on, they start fourth round in Wimbledon, or, or, or I mean, geez, what she? Fourth round or quarter? Yeah, it was fourth round. Fourth, fourth round, round, Wimby, third round, U.S. Open. All of a sudden, yeah. you can't tell them anything. It. No, it's all right. She's forgetting She's forgetting her roots. Yeah, exactly. Getting yeah, where she teacher. comes from. But it's all right. It's all right. Well, I'll put her back down in her place before Australia. Hey, everyone. You're listening to the Tennis.com podcast. We're talking to Chris Eubanks, and he tells us about a little bit of beef he's got with his little sister, Coco Goff, about basketball. Keep listening. So you guys are going to meet up in Boca. Yeah, we're going to do uh, about – it's going to be myself um, and, and Patrick Maradigal actually reached out to me about putting in some time uh, with some, with he and I think a couple of his players um, down in Boca during the off season. So that's something I'm going to go down there for. I'm really excited about um, middle of December. We're going to go down there. We're going to get after it. So I'm really, really excited for that opportunity. And even more excited now that I know Coco's been talking, <laughs> running the mouth a little too much. Well, you have something to look forward to. Um, so, but where's where's home for you? Is it still Atlanta? Still or? Atlanta, born and raised. That's awesome. So you didn't have to go too far when you went to Georgia Tech. No, well, that's, that's part of the reason they recruited me probably because I was in state. <laughs> in state scholarship. In state scholarship, and I was able to get a, a partial academic scholarship via the the Hope Scholarship for students in state of Georgia. If you're able to maintain a certain GPA coming out. Uh, the Hope Scholarship, you qualify for the Hope Scholarship, which even knocks your, I mean, your costs down even more. So it, it, it was a perfect fit, perfect wow. fit. So you got the athletics and the and the brains right there. I mean, there. that's what, uh, yeah. so You got the whole package. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you have the option to go back and finish your senior year there, or is it an online option? How does it, how does it no, go? No, I wish, I wish. I've, I've really, really wanted to try to, you know, finish off getting my degree. But it's, it's, it's I think the courses that I have to finish, I was, I was a little – 
a little eager in school. I wanted to take the online classes when I was there, so I wouldn't have to go to class. And I could just do it on the road, and it was easy. And I used up, I think, all of my online courses. Everything else I have to be there for. So I'm gonna, I'm going to go back and get it. Just a matter of time when. I've had options to possibly do online courses at other schools and then have the credits transfer over potentially, but I kind of want there's something there's some sense of pride in me going back to that school and going back to those classes and those buildings to finish getting my degree that I really want to do. So it's something about walking up Freshman Hill one more time or walk, going through Tech Square and, and going to the business school and Scheller and possibly having to study in the AA that all that over again, even if it does come at a 36 year old. <laughs> I was going to say, sitting you're going to be sitting there pushing in, in, 40s. In, in group projects with, you know, 21-year-olds who Love probably it. had a little, had a good weekend. And I'm like, no, guys, we need to focus. I'm trying <laughs> to get my degree. So if I got to be that guy, I'll do it. It's not a problem, but I'm, I'm, I definitely plan on going back and getting it. But hey, education is education, no matter how old you are, right? Yeah, I mean, I, that's one way to look at it. You know, yeah. I just felt like I, I embarked on something um, when I entered Georgia Tech that I always said I wanted to finish, so. Respect. It's right, more more about the, the the principle, I guess. Love that. Love I that. love that. Yeah. So we've mentioned Atl Atlanta a few times. Another player based in Atlanta, Donald Young. Mm -hmm. Was he anyone you look to for advice when you're making these pro decisions, or maybe even before or now? Yeah. Well, Donald took me under his wing when I was about 15. Oh. So he took me, and I was able to travel with him to, I believe, the summer of 2012. I believe it's the year after he got his career ranking of 38. Uh, he took me with him on the clay court swing. I got to go to Monte Carlo, Rome, Madrid, Nice, Paris, French Open, I believe Wimbledon that year, if not that year, the next year, um, and allowed me to be pretty much like a practice partner with him. So I got to travel. I got to see the best players in the world up close. That was my first exposure, really, to a high-level professional tennis um, or the top level of professional tennis. So having him, he's always been in my corner. He's always been there for advice if I have needed it. Um, and he's pretty much he's been like a big brother even when I transitioned from college. Even while in college, we still would practice together. He would he would text me and say, hey, man, are you able to practice at this time? Kenny was always very clear when they're pros in town, doesn't matter who they are. And you have the opportunity to practice with them. Practice with them first because team practice will still be here. He said these guys aren't going to be here that long and that often. So when they are, jump on them. So we would do a lot of practices still when, I went, when, I, uh, when he would be in town and then I would go and do team practice in addition to that so we tried to find times that work for both of us and then when I moved out of uh college and I decided to transition into pros he's always still been right there uh still practice together uh pretty often in Atlanta when our schedules align and uh still hang out a lot of times at tournaments and when we're both at home so he's he's like wow, he's literally like a big brother to me Oh, that's awesome. There's something to be said that about having a taste of what the pro life is like when you're young. You know, you didn't play the junior slams, did you? You didn't get that chance. So you didn't get that taste, but you got it from Donald. I think that is a big influence in your decisions and your, your path. 100%. I, I didn't feel like I was walking into something that I hadn't seen before. So even like seeing players up close, um, interacting with a few of them um, and a few coaches, even when I was just a, a practice partner. And then when it came time for me to make the decision and I went out there, I kind of knew how things went. I kind of knew okay, so I sign up for practice plus looking. Okay, that means someone else will see and they'll sign up with me possibly or um, get it, uh, getting the, the hotel, the transportation from the courts to the, the hotel and knowing that it works on the schedule. These are things that I would have had to kind of find out on my own because I had done it when I got out there. I said, oh, yeah, we'll just drop it off at Strain, probably catch the shuttle. I was able to plan out and schedule the times and schedule um, of my day based on what I had experienced before. So it made things, it made the learning curve a lot smoother. That's awesome. Little that, things matter. Absolutely. I mean, so you're going, uh, you're finishing up your off season in Boca and then going back to Atlanta. Yes. And then yes. You'll and, be then, and then I'll be in Atlanta probably until uh, January 2nd when I leave for Australia. Sweet. So which tournaments are you going to be playing there? Um, Canberra and then Australian Open. So challenger in Canberra the first week. Uh, I believe the second week and then Australian Open Qualities. Awesome. I might see you there. Hey, let's Maybe. do it. Let's Maybe. do it. Maybe. Can I ask you another oddball question here? If I said no, would you still ask? Probably, yeah. Okay, let's do oh, it. Oh, yeah. All right. All right, I read somewhere that Donald Young has a great apartment, and when he has friends over, he gets annoyed because they, they all use water bottles and just leave them half drank open or have only one <laughs> sip. Does he really have a vending machine where he charges 25 cents? I knew, I knew the vending machine was coming up. I knew the vending machine was coming up. Yes, yes. He does. Yeah, to Genius. show some sense of, you know, appreciation. You know, if you really want a bottle of water, you know, and you put 25 cents in, you're probably just not going to leave it half empty and then walk out. So 
uh, I had no idea where you were going with it. I said, half empty <laughs> water bottles. Where? And then I said, oh, it's a vending machine. Here we go. Here we go. Yes, there's a vending machine. That's awesome. I think that's the smartest thing I've ever heard. That's, I mean, I really, it really bugs me too. <laughs> I'm surprised. It should start happening on tour. I wouldn't be surprised if they start doing that because the amount of times that I see half open bottles. And or, cans oh, and yeah. things left on the court. Or even just like a tiny bit like drank and you're like, oh, I can't drink it. I'm like, come on. I just think on. Donald's an innovator. That's what I'm here to say. He is. <laughs> He's taking care of the environment one bottle at a time. Smart guy. I like it. My memory is bizarre. I remember the weirdest things and that was one and that's, I, I, that's, I really wanted to ask you. That's pretty weird, but go ahead. You're welcome. Uh, all right. And then, I mean, again, this is all stuff I'm getting from your Instagram for the most part, but not, not the Donald Young stuff. I was but about to say, yeah, no not vending this, machine. Not the vending machine, but uh, you played Arthur Ashe. I did a documentary, a virtual reality documentary in 2017 is when we did the filming of it. It released last year at the U.S. Open in 2018. That's premiered wow. there. incredible. That's awesome. Yeah, so what an I, honor. Yeah, so I was. Uh, I, I got a call asking if I'd be interested in participating in a virtual reality documentary and playing Arthur Ashe. I said absolutely. So I got on the phone, spoke with the director. He said, "Chris, I've seen you. He said we think you'd be a perfect fit. We're just going to ask you to, you know, start out possibly growing your hair." And this was probably in. February or March, somewhere around then. So I said, whatever you need. So I think we did the filming the week after I finished the U.S. Open in 2017 in Forest Hills. So I left New York, flew back up to New York. Um, yeah, wow, that was a lot. That was a lot of time in New York that year. So 2017, played main draw U.S. Open, um, played doubles I think with Christian Harrison that year. We second round. And then I had the, I don't know if you remember, there was a collegiate invite that they would hold the second week of the U.S. Open. So yep. instead of leaving, I just stayed in New York for that entire time. I practiced, went, how I was able to practice with Roger and everything. So got that opportunity, practiced, trained for that, did the collegiate invite, left New York, had about three days at home and had to fly back for, to Forest Hills uh, to do filming up there. And it was about two days, really, really long days, and then uh, went on back. And they said, all right, um, it's going to take some time because, you know, virtual reality is a little different. And it's going to take a lot of editing, and a lot, but we'll let you know when it's finished. I kept in contact with the director. He said it's going to premiere at the U.S. Open um, in the Fan Zone Interactive Center or whatever. And I went out got to check it out last year. It was pretty cool. Did you grow your hair out enough? That's I did. Really I question. did. I did. I was, I was very – I said, how do you want it? So they sent me pictures. This is like the desired look we were looking. I said, no problem. So luckily, I actually wear glasses, so wasn't I have a pair of glasses. They had some for me as well, and it, it worked out. It worked out perfect. That's was awesome. there a lot of acting, or was there a lot of hitting? What was the uh, part of a it? A little bit of both. It was, we spent we spent a good amount of time with me and my lines, making sure that the, the scenes were believable, and I got to convey a lot of the emotion that they were looking for. And then there was times in which we spent – probably a couple hours on court for one point because we had to get it exactly right playing on old school grass, wooden rackets, old balls. I, we had to do, I'll never forget, we had to have the exact play, uh, kick wide on the ad side, serving volley, backhand volley, open court, and then there was a little bit of a celebration that was done. But in virtual reality, everything is on one continuous shot, one take. So we started at the point before, Arthur wins the point, the ball kid runs across, grabs the ball, rolls it to the ball kid in the back. The ball kid in the back picks it up, brings it to Arthur's strings. He gets it. He gets one, two bounces, serve, kick wide, come in, volley, open court. But the camera's in the middle of the court because so, the look that they're wanting, they're wanting the ball to come right at the lens, and then I come and take it right before it hits the lens and hit the volley. Because at that angle, the camera could then get about 320 degrees, not a full 360, but about almost 360 of everything around. So... Need everything had to be perfect, and it took us I don't know how many takes because oh you've been on old school grass, you can bounce the ball and you have no idea where it's gonna go. Right, right. So everything from the ball kid sprinting across and missing picking up the ball, they gotta go cut start over, and then he gets that right he rolls it to the guy at the back, the guy at the back fumbles it up start over, runs across slides it, oh my to the rolls it to the ball kid at the back sits it on the strings bounce bounce the second bounce the ball shoots somewhere I can't control it start over. Say I missed the serve, which happened a lot. Start the serve. I'm serving with an old, I believe, a Jack Kramer Wilson wooden racket. So if I miss, if it doesn't go in, and it's supposed to be wide, if it doesn't go in, start it over. If the guy who I did it with, Alex LaCroix, who actually played at Florida, was a really good college player, if he misses the return, 
or he doesn't put it right in there at the lens. Start it over. Got to do it again. They pay you enough for this? Uh, actually, I did it voluntarily. <laughs> I wish. I wish. When I got out, I said, oh, play Arthur Ashe in the documentary? Awesome. Yeah, no questions asked. Let's do it. At about our, I think, probably the 40th take of the same thing, I was like, man, I'm ready to... <laughs> Where was this your agent? Where was your agent? <laughs> yeah. I didn't ha- actually, ironically enough, I didn't have one at the time because I was still thinking I might go back to school. I Granted, know. this was right after the U.S. Open. I didn't decide to go pro until like another month I'm later. I'm sure your agent What's, was just yeah. like, gosh darn it. We should have had this What's contract. the documentary called if anyone hasn't seen uh, it? Ash, Ash 68. All right. All that's right. Awesome. That's. I mean, that's another experience, though, that tennis has given you. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Good. Experience of a lifetime. So you got a little bit of acting, got a little bit of basketball. What else do you do off the court? sleep <laughs> sleep i mean i spent so much time uh and arena knows spent so much time on the road living out of suitcase when there's downtime i want to be at home in my apartment in my bed with just doing almost nothing because when you're on the road everything is so so on a schedule and so regimented you want everything has to go boom 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 boom, boom. i want to be able to go home get my practice in strength and conditioning and then after that say you know what i'm not doing anything but sit here and watch The Blacklist on Netflix. So Love that show. It's a great show, huh? Love it. Yes, I, I can't wait for the new, <laughs> new season. season. Yeah. Starting up now, I think yeah. season seven. Yeah, and I'm like, it's funny you say that because I was talking to you just a couple days ago and I asked you, I was like, oh, you know, we should do this podcast. And you're like, well, let me just look at my program. Oh, actually, right now I'm supposed Does to be having a shake. shake. Yeah, yeah had to go pick up the shake. Yeah, had like a, it said, you know. 11 to 11.30 shake. Wow, yeah. you seem organized. <laughs> oh, it wasn't by me. I'm I'm fairly organized, but that's a different level. Awesome. That's something that I can't even really, I can't, you know, even say, oh, yeah, that's smart. Let's put the shake in. <laughs> like, no. Stretch. Stretch. Start a regimen, right leg. A routine. Right, right leg. Left leg. <laughs> hamstring. Calves. <laughs> shoulder. Love it. <laughs> All right. Last question. We, we talked to you one year from now, end of 2020. What would a good year look like to you? It's a very good question. Uh Good year to end of 2020, I would say I'm sitting close around top 100, if not in the top 100. I, there's some work that has to be done, but I think with the, with the kind of the lessons that I've learned from year two, I take that into year three and I'm as productive as I know I can be and I'm as diligent as I know I can be and will be, then I should put myself in a really good position to be sitting somewhere around the top 100 come uh, end of the year. So. All right. Let's Looking go. forward. We'll Looking, be cheering yeah. for you. Thanks Let's you. go, I Jackets. Looking forward to watching you in 2020. I think we'll uh, close on that. This has been the Tennis.com podcast. I've been Nina Pantic with Irina Falcone and Chris Eubanks. Thanks for having. Thank, thanks for allowing me to come. Always. From the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, this has been the Tennis.com podcast. Be sure to subscribe to stay caught up. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and every major listening app, as well as Tennis.com slash podcasts. You can also see the video of our episodes on Tennis Channel's YouTube page and Tennis.com's Facebook page. We're your hosts, Nina Pantic and Irina Falcone. We'd like to thank our team, editor and audio designer Luke Mahoney, video editor Christina Koseva, producers Alexa March and Sean O'Malley, and executive producers Shelby Coleman, Kyle Einhorn, and Andy Chu.